This is Joshua English for the Alameda County EMS Audio Podcast. The airway checklist is actually it's, uh, it's inspired from three sources, um, blueberries, pilots, and the World Health Organization. In this first episode of 2010, I sit down with Mike Tagman, General Manager of AMR Alameda County, to talk about a collaborative effort between AMR, EMS, and the fire service looking into ways to better use data that is, using data from a patient-centered focus to see if our efforts in the field are translating into better, more complete care. Our guest today is Mike Tagman. He's been in EMS for many, many years. He worked in the field for 15 years and currently is the general manager of AMR in Alameda County. Now, you're probably thinking to yourself, blueberries. Why would you think blueberries? Well, yeah. What do you mean by that? Some of you probably remember several years ago um, when the research studies came out that said if you eat a lot of blueberries, um, you have less cancer. Remember that? So the question was, why do blueberries cause less cancer? And antioxidants was the answer to that. This is great. Take a bunch of blueberries, get the antioxidants out of it, put it in a pill so we can sell it and make more money and we'll give people the blueberry antioxidant pills. So uh, they did a couple research studies on that, and guess what happened? Well, let me guess. It really didn't help? They actually increased cancer rates when you pull it out. So the lesson from that is you've got to eat the whole blueberry. You can't eat just parts of it. You've got to do the whole thing. <laughs> All right. Well, what do pilots have to do with this? The uh, second part of the inspiration for the airway checklist is pilots. Um, now, I don't know if any of you listening to this are pilots. Um, or you've flown with people, maybe done some uh, uh, EMS flight work or any of that kind of thing in your career. Um, but pilots, every time before they fly, what do they do? Well, they go through some kind of checklist, right? Now, do they go through the check? Even if they've flown the aircraft, it's their own personal aircraft, and they've flown it for 12 years, three or four times a week. Um, how often do they do the checklist? Every fifth or sixth time? They do it every time. Okay, And, and do they do just the parts of the checklist they think are important? They do the whole checklist. So pilots, before they fly, do 100% of the checklist 100% of the time. Why is that? If you don't, people could die, including yourself as the pilot. So based on thinking about how pilots use checklists, um, a few years ago, um, folks in medicine um, discovered the concept of checklists for the practice of medicine. And one of the, the first really major projects um, inspired by it was the World Health Organization. And they were looking at uh, surgical suite safety. Um, what is the safety related to um, jumping in and, uh, and taking care of folks who are gonna have any procedure in an operating room? And they went through and developed a, a checklist on kind of basic safety functions. Um, you know, you walk into the operating room and everybody's dressed in scrubs and a mask. So you don't necessarily know who everybody is. So one of the first things on the checklist, everybody introduces themselves in their role. Um, the other thing they do is they mark um, the site of where the surgery is going to happen. Um, you know, every couple of months you'll read some story in the newspaper about somebody who went in and had the wrong leg amputated. So then they have to go back in and amputate the right leg and they end up as a bilateral amputee. Or, you know, people dropped the x-rays when they you know, went into the operating room and grabbed it and threw it up on the light box and put it up backwards and were digging around on the wrong side of the chest looking for a lump to... Um, excise. So it's, you know, it's one of those things where there are a number of mistakes that can be made. And if you go through a routine checklist, um, you can take care of it, giving antibiotics beforehand as an example. So they uh, put this checklist together, it takes only about 90 to 100 seconds to complete the thing. Um, but and there's a, you know, beginning of the operation, right as you induce, and then a post operating uh, checklist. And um, they found that if you do all three of these, um, that you dramatically decrease post-surgical mortality rates and complications. Um, and they found this in, in all seven countries where they trialed this. Uh, so they took the information back, they refined the checklist, 
And this year they're rolling it out to every operating theater on the planet. The World Health Organization estimates that full implementation of the surgical suite checklist will save 2.2 to 2.5 million lives a year on the planet. Uh, people who otherwise would have died are dying today uh, from post-surgical complications. And the, you know, the thing that's interesting about this, doesn't matter how good the surgeon is. It's completely irrelevant of the skill of the person who's doing the operation. Um, and I mean, you can imagine, you know, this checklist is being rolled out to somebody who's been a surgeon for years. How do you think they felt when they were told they had to go through this basic checklist before and after and sign off on it? What do you think their reaction was? Well, I could imagine it was something along the lines of this doesn't apply to me. Doesn't apply to me. It's, this works for those people in, you know, third world countries and that kind of stuff, but it doesn't apply to me here at you know, Stanford or Baylor or Harvard's medical school. It doesn't apply to me from that perspective. Um, but they really pushed and convinced folks, and it turns out that even the best surgeons in the world, when their whole team follows the checklist, they get better results. Okay, so it took surgeons a little bit of uh, time to warm up to this idea. Now, do you think it's going to take the field a little bit of time to, to accept this and you know, adding to the workload? Well, the reality is, um, when you look at the things that we ended up uh, with on the airway checklist that uh, we created in, in collaboration in this community, we had... Uh, you know, Mike Jacobs, Dr. Pointer, Dr. Garrick, folks from uh, uh, AMR, folks from Fremont Fire Department, Alameda City Fire Department, Alameda County Fire Department, Oakland Fire Department, all uh, collaborated together over the course of the last summer to create this. And when you look at the stuff that's on the checklist, most of it we do most of the time anyhow. And uh, the focus of this is let's do it all the time for all the patients who might need it. And we, you know, this is a different mental model than the way most EMS systems look at airway. And you visit almost any EMS system in the US and Canada and ask, well, how are you doing on airway management? And they will give you some number. We're, we are successful 92% of the time. They'll give you some number. And almost invariably, uh, what that number relates to is how, whether they're good at intubating or not. It, it really focuses on that. And when you think about measuring intubation as a skill, it's really a, a provider-centered measurement not a patient-centered measurement. Um, from the patient's perspective, the patient needs open, clear airways in order to be able to get the good stuff in and the bad stuff out, and they need to have those airways protected from aspiration. Those are really the patient's you know, physiologic and anatomic requirements for a good airway. Um, so if you, you know, think about it, the way most people measure airways in EMS, it's like the airway stops at the neck. Okay, but the airway goes all the way down to the alveolar duct, that last little bitty airway that goes into the alveoli before um, things get exchanged um, with the capillaries there, right? So we've taken the approach from a patient-centered perspective of the airway goes all the way down. So the patients that kind of fit into the bucket of folks that really need to have the airway checklist work completed is anybody who has or has the potential to have um, any kind of a blockage in that airway. Um, so your asthma patients, your pneumonia patients, your congestive heart failure patients, um, your cardiac arrests, your people who are really drunk and need to have their spine immobilized after a, a car crash, people who've uh, had burns that may involve their face, um, inhalation injuries, you know, anybody who's got any respiratory complaint essentially. Those people all kind of fit into the category of people we want to make sure these activities get done on. Um, and then the, the, the next piece of it. So what is it we want to make sure everybody gets? And um, we've kind of broken it down into two sides on the, on the checklist. There's kind of the assessments that we think everybody should get and the treatment that we think everybody should get. And some of this is intuitive. Some of it we are, most of it we already do, um, but it's not necessarily always well documented um, for folks. Um, so on the assessment side, full set of vital signs and includes counting a respiratory rate, of course, not just not just guesstimating, but actually uh, actually counting it, uh, measuring um, their SAO2, you know what is you know, what is their oxygenation status, um, end tidal carbon dioxide monitoring, which is something that's relatively new. Um, a lot of people only use it in cardiac arrests on patients they intubated, but it, it's a lot of information you can gather about how well a patient's doing by using that on somebody who's. Uh, not in cardiac arrest, and certainly if you are intubating patients, um, the second you get the tube dropped, you ought to have that entitled CO2 on because that really is one of the best clues to let you know that you've put the tube in the wrong hole. And uh, and certainly when we think about the worst consequences of airway management, 
uh, putting an endotracheal tube in the esophagus and not recognizing that it's in the esophagus, you know, is essentially a, a death sentence or a, a serious brain damage uh, sentence for folks, right? Um, next is, uh, is lung sounds. Uh, you want to listen to people's lung sounds. And, um, you know, one of, the, one of the best practices I believe you can have in EMS is to listen to breath sounds on everybody. If you assess breath sounds on every patient you interact with and just make that a habit, um, you'll have listened to so many breath sounds that the minute there's something odd, it'll jump into your ears. You'll notice, wow, this is different than the last 35 I've listened to. Maybe this is the crackles of pulmonary edema or, you know, you pick up a, a wheeze or something like that, that if you don't listen to them regularly, um, you you'll might miss. It's also reasonable to think about using hearing protection on the way to the scene. You know, if you sit right underneath the siren, whether it's in a uh, pumper or in an ambulance, um, and listen to that loud noise all the way to the scene, when you put the stethoscope in your ears, your hearing is, it's, you know, it's kind of like going to a rock and roll concert and then going home and trying to have a normal volume conversation. Your hearing's screwed up, so it makes it harder for you to hear lung sounds. So you protect your hearing a little bit. Um, then record skin signs. Um, you know, are they moist? Are they cold? You know, what's their skin color look like? Um, and then one of the next things we want to um, mention is, um, did the patient improve? And uh, yes, no, or it's not applicable. It's, if the patient looks good, you know, all their vital signs, their SAO2, all that kind of stuff is all normal. Um, they're not going to get any better than that. Um, but so you want to, you know, write down that it was not a, not appropriate uh, to for them to improve. But if they're showing signs of hypoxemia or you know uh, difficulty with their um, respiratory effort or any of that kind of stuff. You want to document um, that improvement or if it, if it got worse um, or if it didn't change. Um, and then also make sure you um, take a good respiratory history. You know, those things like, you know, do you have a fever? Have you been coughing, producing sputum? What's it look like? Um, those kinds of things. And make sure that that is documented from the assessment perspective. And um, for the vital signs, SAO2 and tidal CO2, lung sounds and skin signs, you want to reassess. Um, oftentimes you look at patient care reports and there's a really good initial assessment, but we're with the patient for, you know, 20, sometimes 30 minutes and there's no reassessment. And, you know, one of the only ways to measure and, you know, prove as a system that we're doing good things for patients is if you do a second secondary assessment and do it again, repeat it. Um, and then on the, on the next part of the airway checklist is what are the interventions? What are the things we want to actively do for people who have or may have uh, potential airway problems? So oxygen is pretty straightforward. Um, no, no confusion or concerns about that. Next one is positioning uh, the patient's airway. And usually think of, you know, head tilt chin lift kind of things when you think about positioning the airway. But, um, you know, for somebody who's got asthma, you know, when you walk in and they're leaning forward, their hands are on their knees and kind of that tripod posture, they have self-positioned themselves uh, for optimal airway flow in the middle of kind of a respiratory crisis. Um, so you don't want to take that patient and force them to lay back on a stretcher and strap them in um, because that makes their work of breathing more difficult and can decrease how, how well they're doing. So paying attention to positioning, um, you know, we, we do immobilize people a lot on backboards. Um, and a lot of the people we immobilize have other um, things going on in their system, whether it's alcohol or crack or, or whatever that can alter their sensorium and also can make them nauseated. And, you know, if you've got somebody who you've strapped down on a backboard, um, you know, they're, they're at risk, particularly if they're intoxicated or any of those kinds of things for vomiting and the risk of aspiration is high. So taking the time and energy to position them so that if they do vomit, um, you can uh, adequately protect their airway, whether it's having the, the Yankar suction tips stuck underneath the, the head of the backboard so that you can grab it right, right there or tipping them up on their side or whatever it happens to be. But making sure that you put them in a good position and you document that you've done it um, meets this part of the, the checklist. Next one is to open and clear the airway if it's appropriate. If the airway is clear, you just document that the airway is clear and there's no need to open and document it. For, uh, for patients who, if they've got an uh, asthma attack, um, you, get, you give them an inhaled beta agonist treatment, that's opening and clearing their airway. Um, if they've got congestive heart failure and you put them on CPAP, that's action to open and clear their airway. Maybe it's dropping an endotracheal tube, maybe it's a king tube, uh, maybe it's just uh, positioning their airway with a, 
a nasal trumpet until the Narcan kicks in and reverses their heroin overdose and they can wake up and, and manage their way on their own. Those are all um, parts of it there. Okay. Um, next one is if the patient is hypoxemic, um, if their SAO2 is low, um, then we want to uh, document that we've raised it. And it's certainly the objective is to produce results for the patient. So we want to um, count that score and that's important. Um, next one is to prevent aspiration. Take steps to prevent aspiration. Um, and sometimes, you know, with some of our patients, since we've got uh, Zofran as one of our um, medication options now, giving somebody Zofran can be one of the mechanisms used to prevent aspiration, um, positioning, those kinds of things, but taking active steps to do that, and then offering them a, a ride to the hospital, offering ambulance transport. And that's the, the key to that aspect of it. Now, one of the things that's it's different about this kind of a composite score as composed to a component score, which digitubum or not would be, um, is that kind of like eating whole blueberries, you got to get the whole checklist in order to have done the composite of care for the patient. Um, so the score is, uh, you get a score of one if, you, if all of these things are documented. Um, if any one of them are missing, you get a score of zero. And it's, it's really a patient-focused score. It's not, it's not intended to grade the provider. Um, it's not a new way to be spanked or any of the rest of that kind of stuff. It's really focused on, did we produce the results for patients that is, as a system we've committed to producing? Um, so um, I think it's important for providers not to, not to think of this as a way for them to be judged. Um, one of the things that um, we're working on, on the, kind of the backend data infrastructure is a way to um, you know, find all the patients that should have airway checklist done and do an assessment to see what percentage of them got a score of one. And our uh, intention is to be able to make it available to everybody in the system on a regular basis what our system's performance score is in relation to uh, this aspect of uh, managing patients. So we'll be able to know what percentage of patients get a one and our quality improvement focus, energy, and methods um, are going to be focused around getting a higher percentage, if not 100%, working that direction of the patients who need to have comprehensive airway checklists completed, completed just like the folks at United Airlines want checklists done 100% of the time on all their flights. All right, so, so how, do you, how do you address the medic... Uh, that says, man, this is just uh, this is just more paperwork for me. Um, well, in the in the conversations I've had with medics about this, when they understand the background, because um, the first hurdle you have to get jump over is, you know, hey, I already do most of this stuff. Why do I have to have it in a checklist? Well, most pilots do most of this stuff most of the time. Most surgeons do most of this stuff most of the time. Um, if you're going to go in and have your mitral valve replaced. Um, or your hip replaced, or whatever it happens to be in the operating room, do you want your surgical team to, you know, we do most of this, trust us, or do you want them to do all of it? And if it's you, you really want them to do all of it. And um, it's not really extra work to do any of this kind of stuff. And if you think of it as extra work, then it's like, wow, what are you, what are you missing on the, on the patients you're providing care for to start with? And, you know, the, the reason, the only reason we exist as an EMS system is to care for people who are sick and hurt. And, and this is the best knowledge we've got in the industry now. We've got uh, all the, Rebecca, before she left for medical school, pulled all of the research studies that support all of the things that are on this checklist. So we've got a list of literature um, that backs this up. So this isn't just pulled out of the air. There's science behind um, pretty much everything that's on here. Skin science is, uh, is the only one that doesn't have great um, stuff behind it. But we've had some folks on the team that were pretty strong advocates for that one. And I've found that if um, people get it within that framework, they don't push back on it. So uh, is this composite versus component scoring methodology being used uh, in EMS anywhere else in the country or the world for that matter? Not that I know of. We're the first people in the country really looking at composite scoring like this. And, you know, one of the this is this is really kind of the beginning um, in our conversations with uh, with Dr. Pointer and, and Dr. Garrick and whatnot we're probably going to end up with composite scores that will be developed with the same consensus process uh, for cardiac arrest, uh, STEMIs, strokes, major trauma, 
Um, unconsciousness and pain are probably going to be the list. Maybe one or two more, but certainly under 10. Um, and the, the ultimate objective is for us to have uh, a dashboard of composite indicators that as a system, we can know if we're producing the results for patients that we intend to produce, if we do what we say we intend to do. Um, and once we get that system put together and do the performance improvements so that we're getting high percentage scores of one for the categories of patients that we do the most good for, I think we'll be able to say not only every EMS system on the planet says they do good work, we'll be able to prove it. Well, this sounds really unique, you know, really innovative. So uh, just, uh, you know, in, 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 your, in your wisdom, how, just how innovative is this? Is this something that can go worldwide? I, th I think this uh, has the, the, the concepts and the principles absolutely have the pr potential to extend worldwide. All right, so you've given us a really uh, detailed uh, view of each of the components, but would you take the time right now to just run through it uh, from beginning to end? How does a medic fit this into his workflow? Um, and it, it, it's been different, different places. Um, many of the, the um, fire agencies that we worked with in the county, they uh, went out and got uh, stamps made up um, and, or stickers made up to go on, uh, on some of the paper forms. Uh, to do this, um, we do have the data elements mapped in BioKey uh, and in Meds for how to document this way, and we've got PowerPoints available and all that kind of stuff that the the team put together in collaboration. Every everybody from all the fire departments involved and in AMR and the EMS agency all contributed and did parts of the PowerPoint. It was a it's a really a fun um, collaborative effort, um, but rolling it out and then starting to collect data so that we kind of know where we're starting from. And, you know, quite frankly, you know, looking at patient care reports at this point in time, not all this stuff is going to be on most reports. So I, I suspect our initial look at the data is going to have us be in the under 10% category for performance related to this. And then it is about education, coaching, feedback, follow-up. And it's pretty straightforward what you need to do. There's nothing magical here. There's nothing, nothing secret about it. Um, it's about doing it and documenting it and being able to pull information out of the documents. So as you do the coaching, we expect the numbers to go up. And, you know, as we do that, then, you know, it should be the reliability of clinical care and the results for patients should improve right along with it. All right. So for any members of the public that might be listening, uh, tell them how this benefits them. You know, we're all taught at the very beginning of our medical careers, the ABCs. Um, and the reason we're taught the ABCs is because if you don't have that part together, your chances of survival vanish. And airway is the most basic one of those. Beginning with this, ensuring that we've got people's airways really covered. Um, I think it's just one of the most basic elemental things of medicine. And, you know, every once in a while we hear about um, patients that, you know, ended up with a, a tube in the wrong place and it didn't get recognized and those are those are often not survivable complications um, and you know if you nail the airway checklist and tidal co2 goes on right after any airway management action happens you should be able to get feedback instantly that you're not in the right place and uh, you know as somebody once said it's fine to tube the esophagus the problem is if you leave it there and don't know it's there so it's about pulling it and and better managing that airway so that for the handful of patients, it may make the difference between life or death. Um, but for any of you who have ever had any kind of an airway problem, um, I grew up with asthma. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's pretty uncomfortable not to be able to breathe. And if, you're, if your airway is blocked, having your health care providers help you clear it and keep it open is it's like a godsend. You've been listening to the Alameda County EMS Audio Podcast. This is your host, Joshua English. Next time, we'll be in conversation with Mike Tagman again. You can download this and past episodes of this podcast on our website at acgov.org forward slash EMS. You can also download our iPhone application, which has access to our county protocols, as well as very important phone numbers to contact our hospitals. Thanks for listening.